film is going, but we forgot joys and concerns. Does anyone want to share joys and concerns or knowing that? Yes. Josh's father, Howard, who just recovered from heart surgery, or was recovering from heart surgery, and now has COVID. Anyone else? Yes. coffee hour after so we can find you no Michael he will okay <laughs> thank you anyone else I have a joy it's nice to see the Huntington's again <laughs> guys have been gone for a few weeks, so welcome back. Anyone else? Oh, and I should say also that Barb is now back on U.S. soil. She has had a wonderful time in Canada, and she's ready to close out the end of her sabbatical, so it won't be very long. Um, and also, Andrew um, is now out of the hospital. Um, he was in for most of last week, but it seems to be doing better. <coughs> so. Yes, Nettie. It's nice to have Kat back in her Oh, Kat! Yeah. <laughs> We're back there. Yeah. Good to see you back. extravagant and gracious welcome where whoever you are and wherever you are on your faith journey you are welcome here and I've done this before and gotten away with it so I'm gonna try it again but I want to sneak some extra material into the welcome I saw this poem and I just wanted to share it with you um, it's called for everyone who tried on the slipper before Cinderella for those making tea in the soft light of Saturday morning, in the peaceful kitchen, in the cool house. For those with shrunken hearts, still trying to love. For those with large hearts, trying to forget. For those with terrors they cannot name, upset stomach and too tight pants, for those who get cut off in traffic, for those who spend all day making an elaborate meal that turns out mediocre, for those who could not leave even when they knew they had to, for those who never win the lottery or become famous, for those getting groceries on Friday nights. There is something you know about living that you guard with your life, your one fragile, wonderful life. Wonder, as in awe, as in I had no idea I would be here now. For those who make plans and those who don't, for those driving across country to a highway that knows them, for the routes we take in the dark, trusting for the roads for the woods for the dead humming in prayer 
for an old record and a strong sun, for teeth bared to the wind, a pulse in the chest. There is every reason to hate it here. There is a list of things making it bearable. Your friend's shoulder, Texas barbecue, a new book, a loud song, a strong song, a highway that knows you, sweet tea, an orange cat, a helping hand, an unforgettable dinner, a laugh that escapes you and deflates you like a pink balloon left soft with room for goodness to take hold. For those who have looked in the mirror and begged, for those with weak knees and an attitude, for those called sensitive or too much, for those not called enough, for the times you needed and went without, for the photo of you as a child quietly icing cupcakes, your hair a crackling thunderstorm. Love is coming. It's on its way. Look. You can now stand and greet each other. Righteous one, we are thankful that justice flows from you like a stream. You bid us to come and experience the equity of your love. We rejoice in knowing that justice is an aspect of your love and is without end. Enable us to be steadfast in our hope in you as we work alongside you to ensure those who need justice receive it. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to come over here so I don't lose the papers. I love this church. It feels like home to me. My husband and I joined in 1986, and I've had many roles over the years. I've been treasurer, I've been finance chair, youth group leader, Sunday school teacher. My three boys were all actively, and I do mean actively, involved as they were growing up. Our family has experienced baptisms, a wedding, and a funeral here at Second Church. The congregation and the church itself, with their, feeling, with their feelings and messages of hope and love, strengthen me every day. I am blessed to be part of this church community. 
On Rally Sunday, we ask you to write down ways the Second Church has helped you each grow your faith. Your responses were thoughtful and considerate and heartfelt. So much so that we made the poster out of those ideas so we wouldn't lose the feelings that we share. If you haven't taken a chance to look at it, please do in the Founders Room. It really says a lot about our church and the words that are on it are uplifting and make, me, make my heart happy. But today, I'm gonna to ask you to look forward. <coughs> what is your vision? What is our vision for Second Church in the next five, 10, 20 years? What's important to you? What do you believe will help us grow and thrive here at Second Church. Currently, we host a variety of programs here at our church, including Girl Scouts, TOPS, AA, Common Goods. We're a city voting site. Are there other opportunities where we could use this building to expand God's work? And what about the church building itself? Are there things we could do or need to do in order to ensure it symbolizes the faith and welcoming spirit that we share? The list of mission projects that we support is long and varied. Too long to name them all today. But is there a mission project in your heart that you'd like the church to explore and consider? Are there ideas you have for our service, for our music, for our children's programs? Are there outreach opportunities that we haven't yet considered? Maybe increasing fellowship through groups and activities here in church. Can we reach beyond these walls and into the community more? Are the things that we do now that are important to keep for our future growth? Things that should be highlighted and not forgotten when looking to the future. What is your vision for the church, for our church? What ideas have you got to get there? Think outside the box. Be creative, even be crazy. Sometimes the best ideas and thoughts are those that start out as a bit crazy in the beginning. But most importantly, please, please share your thoughts and ideas with us. This is our church, and all of our input is valued and needed in order to move forward. Would you please take a few minutes, and I'm not going to ask you to do this all year long, but to share your vision of Second Congregational including ideas that you have that might help our church moving forward and living that vision. Please write them down on the leaves that you have, and then after the service, they'll be asked to place them in the baskets at the, at the Founders Room or at the end of the aisle, so that we can put those ideas together. Put them together, look at them, and share them back in the coming weeks. We'll also keep a basket in the Founders Room for ideas in the next few weeks, because I know that I'm now kind of putting you on the spot at this point. But if you could take a few minutes now and do that for me, we, for us, we would appreciate it. Okay, thank you for your thoughts. You can continue to write, you can write later in the service, you can write after church. We would like you to think about it and give us any ideas and thoughts that you have. But we're not done yet. The next question I have for everyone is, how can this be accomplished? 
What do we need to do to make our dreams and visions for Second Church become a reality? Do we need a church building? Do we need staff who are willing to take the lead? Do we need supply money for outreach, for music, for Christian ed, for vision, for missions? Are these necessary in order to fulfill our vision of Second Church moving forward? Today, I'm asking each of you, on behalf of the stewardship team, to thoughtfully and faithfully consider your pledges for the coming year with a look to our future. Not to simply pay the bills, but instead to give us the tools, resources, and opportunities to truly live our vision of God's community here at Second Church. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings you have bestowed on us, both as individuals and as a church community. And we thank you for giving us the means to do your work. Help us to look to the future and consider how we can strengthen and grow both our faith and our church as we move forward. Help us to live your vision. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. self-serving, and we lose sight of community. 
Sometimes we don't respect you, ourselves, or each other. Yet you are just towards us, even when we are not. We know that we can trust you, so we yield our hearts and minds to you. You are persistent in your desire to restore us because you want us to have what is best for us. Thank you for this moment of transformation. We give you thanks that we are better for it. Amen. Amen. God is the source and provider of grace, love, and justice. And because we are Imago Dei, we have the assurance that those gifts flow through us. They flow through us to us. God's justice makes a difference in us and compels us to show up in the fullness of who we are. The first reading today is from Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 27 through 34. We're back with Jeremiah for our lectionary reading today, but this passage occurs just before the story about Jeremiah buying the deed for property that was already captured by the Chaldean army. That act of hope of believing that God would deliver the Israelites out of exile and give them back their newly conquered homeland was founded on the prophecy that Jeremiah delivers in our passage today. It took over 70 years, but the return from Babylonian exile did come to pass. In today's passage, God promises a new covenant in the midst of a war that Judah had already lost and just before Jerusalem was destroyed. But first, God refutes the old proverb from Judah that the children are punished for their father's sin, stating that for the present, each person will reap the consequences for their own choices. When the days of the new covenant arrive, however, God will put the law within them and write it on their hearts. See, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of human beings and the seed of animals. As I watched over them to uproot and tear down, to demolish, to destroy, and to harm, so will I watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall no longer say, Parents eat unripe grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But all shall die because of their own iniquity. The teeth of anyone who eats unripe grapes shall be set on edge. See, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. They broke my covenant, though I was their master. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will place my law within them and write it upon their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will no longer teach their friends and relatives, Know the Lord. Everyone from least to greatest shall know me. For I will forgive their iniquity and no longer remember their sin. The Word of God. Amen. And now the Gospel reading, Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. It's the parable of the persistent widow. This parable only appears in Luke. And it's embedded in the eschatological context of building the kingdom of God at the end of Luke 17, and followed by another mention of the second coming in verse 8. Within that context, many commentators translate the Greek 
on Takai as very soon and very soon or suddenly without warning so that the parable isn't seen to be promising God's quick response to prayers for justice, but God's promise to restore justice when the Son of Man returns. Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling. But afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust, unrighteous judge said. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect, who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. And that's, that's where the Antakai comes, where... Quickly could be tomorrow, or it could be in a millennium, but quickly in terms of God's judgment. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faithful on the earth? During the last week, in separate conversations, a few friends have expressed to me that the discord violence, and economic hardship in our country will probably not improve during their lifetimes. These friends range in age from 58 to 86. And although my first impulse was to try to cheer them up, each time I was struck by the sense that they may very well be right. Anyone who has engaged in activism, fought for justice, knows that it doesn't happen fast, at least from a human perspective. So how do we persist in our efforts to build God's kingdom on earth? How do we live as the embodiment of Christ in a world that plays by its own rules when we know very well how that story ends. It isn't easy. In both of the lectionary readings for today, they give us an eschatological context. And what I mean is, it, um, it, they show us the long arc, God's sense of time and the human time at the same time to give us perspective. It's kind of double vision that it very strangely operates in the Hebrew Bible reading and also the Gospel. Um, eschatology, the study of last things, gives us our horizon of hope. Jeremiah tells us of a day when the Logos will be put inside of us, written on our hearts. Since Christ is described as the Logos, the Word, in John's Gospel, it makes me wonder if the gift of the Holy Spirit is the way that God accomplishes that. It is possible, and one could make a cogent argument for it. But today I want to talk about the way God's promise of this new covenant in Jeremiah and Christ's promise to return teaches us to focus beyond the present beyond our own lifetimes, to a moment when justice and compassion reign, while at the same time rolling up our sleeves and doing everything we can to work for that moment here and now. Ten years before Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation declared the Southern slaves free, 12 years before the 13th Amendment abolished slavery in the Union forever, the Reverend Theodore Parker 
preached a message of hope for justice in general and for the end of slavery in particular. It was 1853, and he would not have known that the nation's bloodiest war so far would be necessary to abolish the particular institution. But in a time when slavery was deeply entrenched in the Southern economy and the American way of life, his bold hope that things could change was validated. Reverend Parker assured his congregation, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The ark is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends toward justice. The Selma to Montgomery March of 1965 occurred 102 years later, the year after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which did far less to improve the lives of oppressed African Americans than many of them had hoped. In King's own words at the march, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 gave Negroes some part of their rightful dignity, but without the vote, it was dignity without strength. In light of that, King must have known that his 1965 audience would be more skeptical of his hopeful message. They were wondering how long it would take to achieve real change, if real change was even possible. King addressed their worries head on. I know you are asking today, how long will it take? Though he was an eloquent speaker in his own right, Martin Luther King Jr. had studied the great ones who had come before him. Oops. Um, heroes of the past had shared messages of hope in the face of justice, but perhaps more importantly, the passage of time had proven them right. Using the words of other men lifted his audience's perspective above their present frustration. He let history speak for him. How long? Not long, because to, truth crushed to earth will rise again. How long? Not long, because no lie can live forever. How long? Not long, because you shall reap what you sow. How long? Not long, because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Neither of these two men knew exactly when or how, but Reverend King echoed Reverend Parker's faith that God's justice would eventually prevail. And by asserting their faith in God's promises on the horizon of hope, both men empowered others to continue to fight for that promise. And clearly, their desire for justice has not been completely realized. Like Jeremiah and Jesus, Parker and King understood the double vision necessary to continue building the kingdom of God, preaching, marching, encouraging, suffering, praying, and even dying, while focusing on the promise that may take centuries, even millenniums, to come to fruition. In the case of Jeremiah's prophecy the new, of the new covenant, the Israelites were told to make homes, plant gardens, marry, and have children while in exile. And they did return to Jerusalem 70 years later. But in the parable of the persistent widow from Luke, Jesus emphasizes 
only how we must tirelessly confront injustice, even when faced with a callous and unprincipled judge. I absolutely love this parable. It speaks to the divinely rooted call to pursue justice, while also grounding it in the context of living a faithful life. Widows were thoroughly marginalized in ancient society, given the patriarchal culture that governed societal norms, and as such were likely seen as charity cases. What Jesus does in this parable is challenge this assumption of the hapless, helpless widow, giving her agency and authority to challenge corrupt power. The parable of the persistent widow unrelentingly pursuing justice from an unjust judge is best seen as an example, not of how our prayers for justice should be continuous, although they should be, but instead as a paradigm for how we should unrelentingly pursue justice for those denied justice in our society. With a reminder that justice should not only be fair and equitable, it should be compassionate and restorative. Recovering the radical message of Jesus' parable means that we should both recognize the widow as causing good trouble and realize that she should not be acting alone. I think the persistent widow is an example of how Jesus is directing us to live faithful lives. The parable urges us to resist the tendency to think about prayer in, in a simplified and unidirectional way, as merely words we offer to God in a transactional and hierarchical manner. In other words, the idea of praying to God, the Father up in the sky. It also makes a clear, intimate, and inseparable connection between prayer and justice. This parable invites preachers and all who will receive it to think of prayer as an active, dynamic, relational, and even mystical enterprise between us and God. Praying ceaselessly for God's will and the strength to fight for it and continuing to demand justice from the corrupt judge at the same time is the mark of faithfulness that Jesus wants to see when he returns. Continuing to work for justice in the here and now while keeping our eyes riveted on the horizon of hope is building the kingdom. We won't know when smaller victories will be won or when the new covenant will finally arrive in all its perfect glory. But behold, the days are coming. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, give us the strength and the double vision to keep us actively, expectantly working and praying for the complete realization of your justice, peace, and love on this earth. We thank you for the gift of your spirit that keeps your law inscribed on our hearts and reminds us to listen to our hearts. We praise you for the moments of your kingdom that we experience in our compassionate connection with others and in the small victories for justice that we witness. God, teach us to pray more deeply and actively the prayer your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power, and the glory forever.
and comfort them all. Amen. God's justice is persistent in affecting change and invites us to be liberal and tenacious in our giving. Let us bring gifts to further justice and peace wherever they are desired and needed. Let these resources be used to facilitate a just peace for all. Amen.
Thank you.